good morning again, everybody. Man, it's so great to be together this Sunday. What an amazing time of worship. I just really, as we were singing that song about how good God is, I just sensed God's presence here in a really cool way, really neat way, just encouraging us um, how much he loves us. So, man, what a great time just to worship him together. I want to welcome you guys. I want to also welcome all those that are joining us online today. Um, so glad that you trust us and that you join in and, and uh, partner with us and being a part of our, our service today. Thank you so much. Man, if you have your uh, bulletin, man, just get ready for the message today. There's an outline on the back of that. Or if you want to follow along electronically, you can bring up the Version app on your smartphone or tablet. And uh, if you go to events and click on Cornerstone Chapel, it will pop right up there with all the scriptures and everything. But we are in week number four of our discipleship series called Rooted. And today we are going to be talking about this question, where is God in the midst of suffering. Where is God in suffering? And, you know, I believe many of us are asking this question, if not all of us at one time of our life, we've asked this question. And, man, all you have to do is just look at what's happening around the world. You know, look at the news and see all the stuff that's happening in our world. And, you know, this question can come up, you know, God, where are you? All, the, all these things that are happening. And, you know, just even, even recently, you know, with the, 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 the school shooting down in Florida a couple weeks ago, and, and, and many of us can just really sympathize, and we, we just have this yuck feeling, this sorrow in our heart. And, and, and these questions come up like, man, why is stuff like this happening? And, and, and where, where is God in all this? And, you know, as I was processing this question this week, I thought of, you know, our beloved father of the faith, you know, Billy Graham, who we all know this week went home to be with Jesus at age 99. And even though, you know, he died, he passed away, you know, I haven't seen anything but, but celebration all through social media and even on secular news stations. You, I mean, he is just being honored and his life being celebrated in death. And, you know, then you, this week we hear of, um, you know, other people passing away. I mean, it, it really hits home. Like, just, just even in our own neighborhood, even in our community, there, you know, there was, you know, uh, just a, a tragedy that, that happened um, right here in Medina County. And, and the feelings are so much different because with Billy Graham at age 99, and, and we celebrate that, but then we hear of, of, you know, other ones that die earlier and it just doesn't seem to make sense. And then there's, there's this grieving in our heart. And, and so this question can, can come up. And, you know, it's, we've seen this even in Scripture, that the Scripture um, shows this as we look at David who wrote most of the Psalms. You know, Psalms is a really big book in the Old Testament. And David wrote most of these. And many of them are... Are, they start off with David just like, like um, you just he, he just seems um, angry or he seems frustrated. He's just kind of questioning God, like, like, God, where are you? You know, why is this happening? You know, I, I, don't, I don't see you. I don't feel you. You know, where are you at? And as you read, you know, through the Psalms and even towards the end of the Psalms, you know, every time David just seems to come back to say, but God, I love you and I will worship you. And you know, for, for us who are, are choosing to follow Christ, you know, we are going to face sufferings. And I can really relate to David because that's how I feel sometimes. When I see things out in the news and things that are happening in the world and even things that I go through, I kind of respond many times like David, like, God, where are you in this? Man, what, why is this happening but you know what? When you know Jesus and you're rooted in him and he's your rock and your, your foundation of life, you know, it, it might take a while, but you finally get to the point where you say, but God, I will love you and I will trust you and I will live for you. And even in the New Testament, we see this story that we can, many of us can relate to where there was the, these uh, siblings, you know, Lazarus and he had sisters Mary and Martha and um, the Bible says in the book of John that Lazarus got pretty sick one time, uh, sick enough that his sisters 
um, sent a message to Jesus that Jesus would come and, and, and heal Lazarus. And it says that when Jesus got the message, the Bible does not leave this detail out, but the Bible says that Jesus did not respond right away. It says he, he kind of waited and then when he finally started making his way to where Lazarus was, by the time he got there, Lazarus had already died and been buried and been in the tomb. And so his sisters, you know, Martha and Mary, they approached Jesus. And, you know, the, really the scripture shows like the first thing out of their mouth is like, Jesus, where were you? Why didn't you come? Why didn't you come when we first asked you? You know, and... The scripture goes on to say, you know, Jesus mentions that there was purpose in that and that, that it wasn't going to end in vain, but there was a purpose in it. But nonetheless, those questions are asked. We see it in scripture. We're, we're asking these questions. And so where is God? You know, that one of those W questions, but, you know, we, we, we know that if we're Christ followers, we know God's with us, but it almost leads us to that next W question of, okay, God, I know you're here. I might not always feel you. I, not, I might not always sense what you're doing. I know you're here, but why? You know, then, then we ask the why question. And, and so we're going to look at this today. We're, we're going to just see what the Bible has to say. And I think this would be a great time for us to take a break and just pray that you know, that this isn't just something that we hear with our ears today, but I'm really praying today that this message, as we share scripture today, man, it just, it just penetrates and drills deep into our spirit. Um, because, you know, that's, that's really all we have, is we have God's presence, and we have his word. And I, that's what I want to really, really minister to us today. So would you pray with me today as we dig into this? God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for Sunday, February 25th. 2018. It's a brand new day, a gift of life that you've given us, God. Thank you that you've called us to come together as church family. Thank you for this amazing time of worship. And now we have this chance to just sit under the Bible, sit under these verses, God. And Lord, I pray it would not just fall on, on, on our ears, God, but Lord, that you would just, just cause it to go deep down into our spirit, God, because because we know that no matter what we go through, God, that when we have your word as the rock and foundation of our life, God, that no matter what we, what we face, God, your word will sustain us. Your word will keep us, Lord, because you're good and you're faithful. So, God, would you do that today in every person that is hearing this? In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. So let's look at this. Why, why is there suffering? I mean, if God is so loving... Why does he allow suffering? And if he's so powerful, why doesn't he just stop it? Why? Well, we got to go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible and, and see that in Genesis, really, one through three, there is so much happening in these first three chapters of the Bible. But if we look at Scripture, we see that God never intended for us, his creation, mankind, to, to face suffering. Because when he created everything in Genesis 1, then on that last day he created mankind. And then in Genesis chapter 2 it says he breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. And he had relationship uh, with Adam and Eve. And, and everything he created was perfect. It was good. It even says that in the Bible. He, man, he just says, man, everything is good. And he had, everything was provided for Adam and Eve. And he just said, man, guys, you know, I love you. Everything's here. All you have to do is just stay away from the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even the evil. It was the knowledge of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so we know as you go into chapter 3 that the devil tempted Adam and Eve to, to partake of this tree and and because, because they thought they could be like God. And so when, when they did, they, they sinned. And when sin came into the world, then suffering came into the world. And, and all that comes with that, brokenness, sickness, death, all that that comes. And we see that, 
you know, God never intended it, but now that mankind sinned, now suffering's in the world. And really we can see that, you know, we are affected by that today. In fact, suffering really, even though it came in because of sin, there's really like these four sources of where our suffering can come from. You know, the first is, is you know, from us. You know, our decisions can bring upon hardship in our life. You know, if, if you guys are following in, the, uh, in our church's Bible reading bookmark that we give out to everybody, today's reading in Proverbs 9 says, you know, if you embrace wisdom, it will really benefit you. But if you ignore wisdom, you will suffer. And what that means is this. You know, we can make really good decisions. We can make wise choices, and we can benefit from those wise choices. But we can sometimes make bad decisions, and that brings hardship on ourselves. So our decisions can bring that on us. Another place that it comes from is from others. You know, other people's actions, other people's decisions. We look in the, in the Bible that, you know, Joseph and his, he had brothers that, that threw him into a pit and threw him in, you know, and sold him into slavery. You know, he didn't do anything, but it was the actions of others that brought suffering upon him. And then the other source is just the world. You know, living in this world, this world is broken, and, and that affects us in different ways, you know. Um, you know, the, the things that we go through sometimes are a result of living here in this world. And then sometimes it just comes from Satan. It, it's an attack from the enemy. But no matter where it comes from, when sin came into the world and suffering came in, you know, we have to understand that because some people could say, you know, why, why did that happen? Because God loved us so much, he gave mankind the free will to choose, and that was his love. When he created Adam and Eve, he says, I love you enough to give you the free, ch- free choice to choose. Now, now I, you know, you can choose the right thing. But they also had a choice to not choose the right thing. And so when they chose not the right thing and sin came in, I believe God said, you know what I'm going to do? I have a plan B. Now that sin and suffering is in the world, I want to now use what is bad and I want to bring good in it. And so what he did is, you know, Jesus came to earth, you know, to be that remedy. He, he was the, he's the plan B to, 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 to take something that was wrong and make it right. The Bible says in Romans 8 that we know that in all things God works for the, say this, say, for the good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So God is an expert of taking anything taking the bad, taking the suffering, taking the sin, and he can bring something good when we look to him to redeem it. And so Jesus came into a broken world. And, you know, out of all the world religions, you know, Christianity is the, is the only faith, if you will, where God came to us. When, when, when mankind Sin, God didn't run from, he ran to. He came to earth. And not only did he come, but he, he suffered along with us. The Bible says in Hebrews that we don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. I love that. He's not out of touch. He came and he, 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 he was God who became man who went through the same sufferings that we do today. He's been through weakness and testing. He's experienced it all. He's experienced it all except the sin. He never sinned, but he still went through suffering. And the ultimate suffering is when he died on the cross. Because when mankind sinned, you know, we were separated from God. And, and we had this, you know, penalty of, of spiritual death put on us. That, that the only way we could come back into relationship with God is if that, that penalty was paid. So Jesus paid that penalty for us that we can come back into relationship with God. So, so he died on a cross, and when he died, he, 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 he died that we can be forgiven. He died that we can be healed. He died that, you know, for, that for, for many things, you know, that we can experience his abundant life while we're here on earth. But see, as long as we live on this earth, there's this tension. And, you know, if you're going through Rooted, you, you, you'll read that there's this tension that Jesus, you know, he, he, when he died, he said, it is finished. 
You know, he paid it all on the cross, but we still are living on this earth, walking through things, experiencing things, and some things will really never be right until heaven, until we are with God in heaven. And there's that tension that we wrestle with. And that's why he promised that, you know, he, he said, I'm gonna, I never promise that you're not going to face it, but I do promise that I'm always going to be with you, Jesus said. Before he left earth, he said this, while you are in the world, you will have to suffer, but cheer up, I've defeated the world. So where is he? Where is he when, when we're going through suffering, when, when we see things going on in our world? The Bible says, and we believe, that he's with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. His Holy Spirit is always with us. But what I want to talk about today is to go even a little deeper and talk about how God has had this plan B to now use some of these things that we go through to bring good out of it. And so if you're following in your notes, this is really the first, first part that, that we're going to follow through here. God uses suffering to do many things. Now, we're going to talk about three of them today. I'm sure he does more, but we're going, to, we're going to really focus and highlight on these three things. The first one is this. God uses suffering to draw us closer to him. He can use the things that we're going through. Something bad, something hard, a suffering, a trial, a tribulation. God can use that to bring good out of it, to draw us closer to him in relationship. The Bible says this in Hebrews. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us when in our time of need. See, that's what happens. Many times when we go through stuff, we do respond. You know, many times we'll, we'll talk to somebody, we'll talk to a friend, we'll talk to a loved one. But man, when you have faith in Christ, eventually, if you don't do it right away, eventually, you're probably going to go to God about it. You're going to pray, you're going to ask him, you're, you're going you're gonna, to you know, go to him, you're going to bring it to him. And that's what this verse is saying. And that's something good that can come out of it. And I, I kind of like to all, like read this verse in a reverse way, like, like this, watch this. In our time of need, that means when we're going through something, in our time of need, what should we do? Now read the beginning. Approach God's throne of grace. I like that. Because it says that when I'm experiencing some form of suffering, when I'm in a time of need, what does God want me to do? God's going to use that to point my attention back to him. Now if you're like me, sometimes when you're going through something, you might not feel very spiritual, okay? And sometimes, I bet this has happened to some of you, you don't want to go to God because you don't feel very spiritual. You're like, you know what, I'm pretty ticked off. I don't really like what's going on. And you don't go to God. Can I say this? Whether you're feeling spiritual or not, whatever you're going through, in your time of need, God wants you to approach him, okay? And even if you come to God angry or not spiritual, at least you're getting closer to God. Come on. Amen? Because you know what? If you're, if you're really struggling with something, you're ticked off at God, you're angry, you're, you're whatever you're facing, listen, it's not going to get any better apart from God. It's not going to get any better. So you know what? God wants you to come to him no matter what's going on in your heart. Whether you're all handling it pretty good, oh, I'm so spiritual, I'm going through this very hard suffering, and I'm just going to go to God. Okay, well, praise God, that's where you're at. You know what? But most of us, like me, you know, like, like when I'm going through something, man, it's hard. And I just want to go into a corner and punch a wall. I want to get, I, I'm, I'm like, why? Why is this happening? Am I, is this relating to anybody? Let's just be real. Can we just be real? But you know what I've learned? If I stay in the corner, it's not doing anything. I might as well come to God how, exactly how I am. Because then God can not only like help me, but then he can use what I'm going through for his good as well. Amen? So God uses it. God can use our stuff to draw us Closer to him. The second thing is this. It strengthens us in our faith. God uses suffering to strengthen our faith. Guys, we're called to be strong Christians. Come on. 
if you're a believer, if you're a Christ follower, we all have our weak moments. But God has called you to be a strong believer. The Bible says be strong and courageous. And you know what? Coming to church, doing your devotions, serving God, worshiping him, that strengthens us. But there's some areas of our faith that are only going to get strong by going through stuff. And you know, God allows certain things to happen so that you know that 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 God's going to use it to strengthen us cuz we're being tested. We're being tested in it. And that is strengthening us. The Bible says in 1 Peter, it says, So be truly glad there's wonderful joy ahead. <laughs> and even, even though the going is rough for a while down here, it sure is. These trials are only to test your faith, to see whether or not it's strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests gold and purifies it. And your faith, it's far more precious to God than gold. And it, this word tested just really jumped off the page to me this week because God is using these hardships and the suffering that we go through many times to test us, to make us stronger. I'm reminded in Genesis chapter 22 when you know, Abraham and, and Sarah, they were waiting for children for so long and they had Ishmael, which was not you know, the, 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 the child of promise. Uh, and, and then they had Isaac and and Isaac was a teenager, and, and then God showed up one day to Abraham and said, Hey, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac up the mountain and sacrifice him. And you're just like, come on, man, that's just wrong. That just does not make sense. Like, like this, this couple wanted kids, and God gives them kids, and now God's asking them to give them up. And if you keep reading in the story, you can see that the Bible says God did this only to test Abraham. Because Abraham obeyed God, and he was going to do what God called him to do, but God stopped him. because He says, I, I, I see, I see that, that, that you trust me. And so he was tested, but that testing strengthened his faith. It, it builds our character. It makes us more like Jesus. Romans 5 says that we are to rejoice in our sufferings because it produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. Character is that, that us becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. As long as we live on this earth, you know someday when we get to heaven, we're going to be just like Jesus, like it perfectly exactly like Jesus. But while we're living on, on earth, you know, in this broken world with these earthly bodies and these carnal minds and these, un, you know, these sinful desires, you know, we're in this journey, this process of every day becoming more and more like Jesus in every area of our life. God, I want to act like you more. I want to talk like you more. I want to think like you more. You know, God uses the hard times to do that, to form Jesus in us. You know, Paul said in Philippians 3, and I can relate to this because he, he says, it's, it's almost like he's boasting. He goes, oh God, I want to know you. And I want to know your power. Now, many of us would like that. We, we want to know Jesus and we want to know his power. But then right after that, that, Paul goes, but I also want to participate in your sufferings. And you're like, now, if I wrote that, I would not include that third part. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know his power, yeah. But I, come on, I don't, want to really, I don't really want to participate in suffering. But then Paul says, because when I do, it makes me more like you. Wow. So it strengthens us. In our faith. Thirdly, God uses suffering to draw us closer to Him, strengthen our faith, and it in achieve to achieve an eternal purpose. Man, this is huge. Check this out. He uses our suffering to achieve an eternal purpose in and through our lives. Meaning this, kind of street language. You've heard, you've heard this before, right? You've heard, oh well, everything happens for a reason. How many of you have heard that? Right? We've all heard that. That's what we call just kind of street language, because that phraseology is really not in the Bible. Um, but um, the Bible kind of says the same thing in this, that when we go through something, yeah, everything happens for a reason. But really, no, God allows certain things to happen, and he can use it to achieve an eternal purpose. And what that means is this, is that, that, that's, that he'll allow certain things to happen in our life that we're going to walk through, we're going to face certain suffering and hardship that 
he's going he's gonna to use that to, to do something that matters for eternity. Because a lot of things that we do and we spend our money on, we spend our time on, really, like, it doesn't really matter, you know, for a hill of beans, you know? Like, in, in five years, it doesn't matter, that type of thing. But certain things that God is doing in our life, he's, he's allowing it because there's an eternal purpose behind it, because God's an eternal God, and he really cares about eternal things, okay? And so God, even though we are so temporal, you know, temp- temporal, you know, and we're always kind of worried and concerned about temporary things, like God always, like, what's the Bible say? God's ways are what? Higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So many times we're, we're on this level, temporal, and God's like, like that's good, but there's an, eternal, there's, there's an eternal reason that's much more important. And so a lot of times we don't get it, we don't understand it, but there, 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 there's something happening through what we're going through that's, that's eternal. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, for our light and momentary troubles. Now, come on, have you guys ever kind of looked at your stuff like light and momentary? I'm like, not me. I mean, some of the stuff I go through is heavy and long. And so why does Paul use this language? Because he says, because, because if you look at it in the light of eternity, if you look at it through God's eyes, see, what is heavy to me is light to him. And what is so long to me is momentary to him. But he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory or an eternal purpose. It's achieving something. It's like doing something. Like, that encourages me. I don't know how you get this, how, how you take, receive this verse, but that encourages me because it's like, okay, like, that encourages me because some of the stuff I'm going through, like, I might not see it while I'm on earth, but it's, it, it's, it's going to make a difference in heaven someday. Like, have you ever thought, like, what if what you're going through, what if, what if what you're going through, like, someday when you get to heaven, somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, I'm in heaven today because of what you went through. Wouldn't you say, oh, my gosh, it was worth it? Now, right now, we're like, ah, I don't know. Isn't there another way? Like, I know God's big. He can do anything. Is there a, like, he has different options, right? But, but what if? What if? I mean, it achieves an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. See, because what you see is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Hmm. There's this little verse that you could really skip over in the book of Genesis. The first book of the Bible, last chapter, Genesis chapter 50. There's this little verse, uh, verse 20, where, you know Joseph, I've mentioned him before, but Joseph was this young kid minding his own business, and he had all these brothers, and his brothers were jealous of him, so they were going to kill him, but instead they threw him in this cistern, and then they thought, well, let's sell him, get some money out of it at least. So they sell him, and so they sell him into slavery, and, um, and then eventually he gets falsely accused, and, and, and he's thrown in prison, and just all this bad stuff is happening, and it all started because of his brothers. So fast forward like many years, and now he's like, like in charge of all of Egypt, you know, and there's this drought going on in Israel, and Egypt has food because God used Joseph's wisdom to make sure there's food during a drought. So his brothers are now coming to get food. They don't recognize as Joseph. All of a sudden, they, they realize, oh, my gosh, that's our brother. Can't believe he's alive. Oh, my gosh, we threw him in a pit. He's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. And there's this little verse in Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph says, what you how you intended to harm me, God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. See, his brothers intended it for harm. God used it not only to bless Joseph because he promoted Joseph, but to bless a whole nation with food. Man, that's an eternal purpose that I'm talking about. You know, in Acts, you know, uh, in our, again, our Bible bookmark through the week, we've been reading through Acts. And um, 
you know, I was reading whatever chapter I was in this week, and um, can't remember which one, but I, what I noticed is that the church was really getting persecuted a lot. Have you guys ever noticed when you read through the book of Acts, there's a lot of great things happening, but a lot of times the church is being persecuted, you know, because of their faith in Christ. Well, you know what I noticed is it seems like every time the church was persecuted, the gospel spread even more. You know, and that's another way that God uses hardship and suffering for an eternal purpose. And so God, God is good and God can use our suffering in these ways. And, but, but what is our response? Like, like how do we respond to this? So, okay, so I know God is with me and I know God can bring good by drawing me closer, strengthening my faith and achieving an eternal purpose. But what do I do? I mean, what do I do in the mean, meantime? Because do, do, I, do, I, do I just get, you know, bitter? Do I get angry? Do I pull away? Do I get depressed? Do I retaliate? Do I get angry? Like, what's my response when I'm going through this stuff? And so, I'm sure there could be many more, but I just want to leave you with three. Like, three ways we can just really take this word today and really apply it to our lives. But here's what I believe are just three really good ways that we can respond to the stuff, the suffering, the hardships that that happen in, in our life. So, the first one is accept it. We, 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 we need to accept the suffering that comes our way. And if you're going through rooted, the rooted uses the word surrender. Like, we need to surrender to God. We need to trust God. We, not, not, not a giving up, but a giving over. I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm giving over to God. I'm accepting it. And what I mean by this is really explained so well in, in the book of Daniel where, you know, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and this was when King Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted everybody, he made this big old statue of himself, and he wanted everybody to bow down to it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were men of God, and they're like, we're not bowing down to that thing. I mean, we're not doing that. And they said, well, anybody that does it, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And so... Everybody bows down, and they're still standing up. So he goes, okay, that's it. You guys are in the fire. So it says they tied them up, and they're ready to throw them in, and this is what these three men of God said. Look at this. It says, they replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Um, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Watch this. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You know what they were doing? They weren't giving up. They were giving over to God. They they were accepting where they were at. They were trusting in God. They were saying this, I believe God is able, but I will trust him with whatever I go through. That is powerful. That is a powerful place to live as Christ followers. You know, sometimes we lump those two words that they're exactly the same, believe and trust. I believe in this instance, they're, they're really different. They're like, I believe God is able. I believe it. But you know what? His ways are higher than my ways, and sometimes what I'm expecting or what I'm praying for or what I'm wanting or what I am envision doesn't happen, doesn't happen yet. And so I believe, but I'm trusting you, God. And that's what it means to accept. We accept it. And some people could look at this in a critical way and say, well, you can't, you can never accept anything bad because that's not trusting God. That's, you know, we have to, we have to expect, and, and we are, we are. We're saying, we believe God is able. And just like these, these men of God said, but whatever God chooses, because he may be choosing something that I don't like for a good purpose. But even if he doesn't, I am going to trust God. So we need to accept it. We, that, that's where it all starts. We need to accept it. And that, that, that means we don't give up praying. We never give up praying. We never give up believing that God could do a miracle. God could, God's going to answer our prayers. We always, keep, we always keep doing that. You know, Hebrews 11 said that, that, that 
famous chapter where it talks about the men and women of faith. It lists all these people and it says, all these people experience the breakthrough of God. Then there's a period, then it lists all these people and said, these people didn't. These people didn't. You know, it says, why are some, why, did, why does it look like some prayers are answered and some aren't? Man, I don't know. And, and we will never, some things we will never know until we get to heaven. But we do know this. God's loving, God is good, and God does have an eternal purpose. Amen? You know, Paul was talking uh, in 2 Corinthians one time where he talked about he had this thorn in the flesh. It doesn't even say what it was. Um, some scholars think it's some physical ailment. He had this thorn in the flesh. And it says he, not only did he pray, he pleaded. Scripture says he pleaded with God three times. Oh, God, take this away. And the next verse, if you have a red letter edition Bible, these words are in red because Jesus said this. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, because of that, I will delight in weakness, insult, hardship, difficulties, and suffering. Because I know that when I am weak, he is strong in me. Secondly, so once we accept it, then we keep worshiping. Number two, we keep worshiping. And, and what this means is, yes, singing and listening to worship music is worshiping, but what I mean in this context, church, is this. Worship is simply our response to God. Okay, sometimes it is singing. I mean, sometimes it's expressing, but, but worship is simply when, whenever I respond to him, that is my worship to him. And when we're going through stuff, we, we accept it, but we've got to make sure that we're guarding our heart to keep a soft heart to God, that we're continuing to respond to him. Keep worshiping. Keep offering up a sacrifice of praise. I love in Job chapter 1, Job was, Job was a, um, a man of God, and it says one day Satan went up to God and said, Hey God, I see Job serves you, but you know what? I bet you... If I attacked his family and his stuff, he won't serve you. And so God gave him free reign. He goes, well, you have free reign. Just don't touch him. And so Satan went to work, and Job lost his family and all his possessions. And at the end of Job chapter 1, it says this, at this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. And said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And if that wasn't enough, Job chapter 2, Satan comes back to God and says, okay, well I bet you if I attacked his body, then he'll turn on you. And God said, okay, but just don't take his life. So all these boils and sores came all over Job's body, and he was suffering terribly. And his wife comes up to him and says this in Job chapter 2. His wife said, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Or, in other words, stop worshiping God. Why are you still worshiping God? Look what's happened to us. Look what you're going through. Stop worshiping. See where this worship stuff has gotten us? What's it doing for us? Have, don't raise your hand. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought, why do I even come to church? Why do I even read my Bible? Why am I even praying? It doesn't help. Look, look it's stuff still happens. I've thought that. I've thought that. And, man, if we could get the heart of Job that says, listen, as long as we live on this earth, whether we are serving God or not, we are gonna be a, we're, we're going to experience the results of living in this world, which is suffering. So if I'm going to be on this earth and experience suffering, I want to make sure that I'm staying close to Jesus. But God's okay with some of those venting sessions that we have. God can handle the venting sessions that we have. Because sometimes we have to vent 
And eventually, Job says, you know, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good and, from God and not trouble? Lastly, so we accept that we keep worshiping and we keep doing good. Keep doing good. Man, I love this because God can use the stuff that we're going through to be a blessing to others. I bet you if you really thought, maybe some of you don't even have to think hard. I was going to say if you think hard. But you can probably think of a time that some suffering and hardship you've gone through, maybe fast forward a few years into the future, you're going to like, you know what? Because of what I've gone through, I can help this person. Because of what I've gone through, I can speak into this person's life. I can give this person encouragement because of what I've gone through. I've struggled in my marriage, so I've been able to help this couple that's struggling in their marriage. I've struggled with parenting. I've struggled with my kids. So you know what? I can help this person. You know what? If you're going through something, because we all will, accept it. Keep a soft heart towards God in worship, but keep doing good. Keep doing good. Keep doing what God has called you to do. The Bible says, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Amen.